Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, Rifa, for inviting me, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, such an honour to be amongst these speakers. I totally feel like the imposter here. Um, <laughs> I set up my creative technology company from basically my kitchen. Uh, and my team is an ever-growing motley crew of technologists and creatives. And we're partly based in South London and partly at the Fusebox. So um, the hub manager is there if anyone wants to find out more about the residency because it's amazing there. Um, so my team, we, we love to mix it up. Senses, Technology, software, hardware, robotics, fabrics, printing, uh, experiences, stories. In fact, my design philosophy is diversity. Um, we literally have no boundaries. How did I end up with such a design philosophy? Where did this journey start? So you've already seen the shocking picture of me. <laughs> I know, Reva. Um, uh, yeah, hashtag no filter. People <laughs> did not know how to pose back in the day. Um, and look at that monitor. We used to put fluffy toys and football flags on, on those kind of monitors. So I've always been interested in lots of things, but as a child, I was actually pretty much forced into doing science and technology. I mean, I didn't hate those subjects and I was capable of it, but I just hadn't tried anything else. Um, I guess any deviation was sort of slightly punished or berated. And my biggest de deviation up till my 20s, or happened in my 20s, when I did coding and finance, and I don't really blame my parents, I'm from an immig immigrant background, they worked all hours, and they just wanted to see their children do the best they could, in, in the kind of the normalised idea within the community of what that meant. And also, to be honest, there was no visible role, you know, in creativity. Like, it's even worse in creativity than in technology. So I just didn't know anything about it. So when I, um, so I did follow a science and tech route, and I graduated from Imperial in 1997, so I'm quite old, um, in biochemistry. And at that point, I was just looking for job security. And tech seemed like an, a good option. Um, it ticked a lot of boxes, and I did a short database course, actually, in AS400. If you've worked in insurance, you know it well. And, um, and I was yeah, recruited into financial services, mostly uh, insurance. Uh, worked on Y2K issues. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of those now. Like, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, and management information reports. So I worked on really big data. And I was a pretty insignificant cog in these huge corporate machines. I mean, I was usually the only ethnic minority woman, sometimes in the whole company, no, um, but definitely in my team. But I was still pretty much anonymous. But I earned good money, I met nice people, and I learned invaluable skills. And, you know, data never goes out of fashion, unlike my purple suit. <laughs> and I kind of, but after six years, it's not... I don't know, did I start to hate computers? I don't know, but I did kind of start to think, is this it? So, in my search for answers, I started to go outside of my network, my usual network, to talks like this. And I went to a particularly inspirational one by John Bird, who'd set up The Big Issue, and he talked all about how he'd made all this money from doing good. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to make loads of money from doing good. Um, and around the same time, I started having this really long love affair. Not just with my husband, but with night school. And I don't know if anyone's tried night school, but it's like a parallel universe where everything is possible. So I used it to try all these creative pursuits that I'd never had the opportunity when I was younger. I did so many courses, I cannot tell you, even like a magic course, every, like every <laughs> possible course, um, but mostly art and design. And I, I kind of like ended up with a portfolio for fashion college. So then I um, just did a part-time fashion degree in the evenings. And during the day, I found my kind of doing good for money. And I started working 
uh, for really small activist and fair trade fashion companies like THTC, I don't know if you know them, the hemp trading company, and also People Tree. Um, and actually, that's my final year uh, project, which, which is a collection using sustainable fabrics. So by 2009, I was kind of, I felt really full of purpose, and I was kind of, you know, like, I was so excited about the fact that what I did actually helped people, and I, you know, I could quantify that. And uh, by that time, I was brought in to help set up the London office of a Dutch uh, ethical fashion consultancy. And it was really exhilarating. And I thought, you know, I, I think I could do this startup thing myself at some point. But I had moved so far away from my creative dream because we probably, I don't know, small businesses, they need data and tech more than anything else, especially design ones. So I decided to do uh, another part-time degree because I am addicted to night school. And um, this one was, I don't know, this one is called MA Applied in uh, Imagination. And it was at Central St. Martin's. Has anyone heard of this crazy degree? Yeah, has someone done it? I don't know. Uh, so this was a multidisciplinary MA, and it completely blew my mind. It, it really encourages independent thinking, and we had classes like we'd watch Jaws and talk about assumptions. <laughs> I paid for that. Um, and I guess yeah, it did th turn my thinking upside down, but it also was a bit like a self-help course. It sort of unpacked all my prejudices and assumptions about who I was and where I kind of fitted in into the world. And then it let you kind of repack it back in. Um, so by the end, I sort of realized that you could combine your beliefs, your expertise, however diverse and schizophrenic they might be, and, you know, and what, you're, what you really enjoy doing. So my final year project actually was um, a social benefit experience to help dementia carers, and it was all about sense of self and you know personal objects and personal stories. And this kind of sense of self subject, I realized, was actually a running theme in a lot of things that I was doing. So then I, after the MA, I developed my ideas into interactive jewelry while working part time as a fashion marketing lecturer back at London College of Fashion. And the, the sort of the portfolio I developed turned into commissioned projects um, for this particular band. They're a cyber opera punk band called Intelligentsia, and I know, um, they're brilliant. And Bronwyn wore this um, BBC click, and you know, it was all very exciting. And at the same time, around that time, I had a baby who was here. She's five now. Yay, pleasure. <laughs> um, so this kind of portfolio lifestyle I had worked really well, you know, juggling motherhood and experimenting, trying everything else, and also teaching. But when my daughter turned two, I wasn't looking, but I was thinking I'd wanted a more structured working environment. And kind of honestly, by accident, I don't know if one of those split second moments, I, I ended up being interviewed by an advertising agency, an innovation agency called Unit 9. And I think the, the director, uh, Yates, he probably thought I was bonkers, but they needed someone for their wearables project. And it was a really cool project. They'd got some funding from Innovate UK. And it was called The Pretender Project by RCA grad Yifei Che. So this project was all about possession, being able to control someone else, someone else's body through electro-muscle stimulation and being able to see through VR, seeing what they're seeing. Pretty creepy. And our product, in the end, we could actually zap people's muscles here so their hand moved around with a mobile app. <laughs> so my, um, and my role was a product owner, and, you know, and it, a lot of it was about wearability, so I got to do a lot of kind of UX research within the gaming environment and also with materials, and I thought, in, you know, in the past, the aesthetic of VR and VR-related and hardware peripherals, so dehumanizing, so patriarchal, so 
ugly. And I, I just wanted to soften the whole experience. So I started to bring in all these kind of smart fabrics. During that time, it was the f like, well, that time was the first time I'd been introduced to VR and, uh, and also the haptic concept. And haptics actually means touch, by the way. So that was the, the first of my VR haptic projects. Oops. So by the end of 2016, I wanted to realize my own immersive stories. And with collaborators and paid freelancers, I developed a piece about dark matter. This time it was to you know, explain this very obtuse bit of science. And I thought this was perfect for VR because no one could contest it. It didn't really <laughs> matter what my experience would be. Um, and I wanted to give as much attention to the aesthetic of the garment holding the electronics as a critical part of the narrative Sometimes waiting in the queue for VR is longer than the experience. So I wanted the person in, in VR to be part of the art. Uh, the actual electronics we used, we hacked a blood pressure machine and we put buzzers in and it synchronized with a 360 animation about space. And a funny thing is, I think the, the fashion, you know, I kind of took a risk, but I thought, I've got a fashion degree, you know, let's, let's put it out there. Um, I think the fashion really enable the science and tech to be accessible, you know, obviously to a wider demographic, um, but just generally it kind of really broke down a lot of barriers. And I ended up showing it all over the place, the v &A. it was on the catwalk in Austin, Texas, all this kind of stuff. And even two years on, people still ask to see it. And it's, it's funny because I think the fashion has had a longer shelf life than the technology. <laughs> so, in 2017, uh, I actually started to get my first clients, so I sort of created my business. I worked on wearable prototypes for other designers. I created interactive installations on the King's Road projection maps during Chelsea Flower Show. I ran workshops on VR and art and you know, created a sci-fi event called Hackstop. But in terms of my own exploration, I wanted to bring more of the tangible fashion into the VR. So I sort of went back to my ethical design background as well. The, the, the doing good, you know, I'd kind of gone down the making money and being creative, but I'd forgotten about the doing good. So I brought it back in. And after all this time of dark matter, I just wanted to play with some color. I was like, please, no more, no more darkness. Um, so I painted some flowers and developed them into fabric prints. And actually, I ended up creating a full, well, a small ethical fashion collection, capsule collection, and employed Heba, which, an, which is an immigrant's um, women's charity in East London, to produce it, uh, printing on organic cottons. And I 3D rendered it up. I was in a team. I didn't do all this myself, by the way. Uh, it wasn't just me. Um, so we 3D rendered up everything and put it in VR. And this time, the garment, I sort of thought, right, let's move away from the zap. Let's move away from the buzzers. These synthetic feelings, it's never going to feel like touch. So I, we put pulley systems in the garment so it would move around you and touch you. So when you were in VR, well, people thought that the zombie models were walking past them and they were trying to dodge them. And as they dodged, sort of the gravity of the garment didn't fit with the gravity of the, the mechanics. So it was kind of another creepy experience. Um, and then this year, I actually got some EU funding to develop this further. It's, uh, it's wear sustained funding, so it was, it's about making sustainable and ethical wearable technology. Um, I'll just go to my so with this funding, I've been able to take everything to the next level. We've created a full underwater VR ocean plastic uh, dystopian, ocean plastic pollution dystopia. So that's, that's always great. Uh, actually visualized from scientific data as well. And we've integrated the whole piece uh, with our own developed controlled hapt haptics. So instead of hacking you know, things like blood pressure machine, we've you know, handcrafted silicon tentacles, which inflate and deflate, uh, which sounds, again, like something from Ann Summers, and, um, <laughs> but, um, um, and also air pouches as well. 
And we can control everything interactively through the VR, with our wires, we're using the newest headset, so it's multiplayer. I've had loads of help from people at the Fusebox. And the jackets which hold the electronics have been made by Heber, the charity again. Um, and we've used fabrics, and actually the other jacket has seaweed fabric as well. And I actually have one of the jackets on. It doesn't have the electronics, but these prints that I painted in VR, that, so they're in the part of the pollution scene, and I've put on here. And the reflective bits here mean, if you were to take a photo with a flash, it looks really kind of crazy. So we're still finishing the last bits of the experience. I'm going to show it, uh, well, we're going to show it at London Fashion Week next week at a body data steam hack at Central St. Martin's, sort of not fashion fashion kind of thing. And you know, I'll post footage about it on Twitter and things like that. So. Finally, that's where I started. Uh, after a sort of a winding journey through this rabbit hole of technology and creativity and entrepreneurship, 21 years after graduating, you know, spending time in tech, fashion, addiction to night school, picking up a couple of art school degrees on the side, exploring, searching, failing, um, experimenting, creating, playing, making, collaborating, meeting with loads of cool people. I somehow find myself here, and it sort of feels like the beginning, you know? Um, mixing it all up with a design philosophy of diversity. So obviously this eclectic path I've, you know, has man managed to establish a sort of a great team for future collaborations <laughs> and commercial projects. So if anybody wants to talk to me about those after, please get in touch. Thank you.